Hi, bio people. This screencast is going to be about cloning. And so today we're going to set the stage and explain a little bit about the basics of how cloning works. A clone is an organism whose DNA is an exact copy of another organism's DNA. So something like this is usually what people think of when they think of clones, but cloning actually does occur in nature. Some organisms actually reproduce by producing clones of themselves. Essentially, they duplicate their insides and then split in half and divide, which looks something like this. We call this binary fission, and we're going to see this in action later on this term. The organisms that result from binary fission are exact copies of the original. In order to understand the basics of cloning, we need to set the stage first. All the cells in your body have the same DNA. DNA codes for mRNA, which codes for tRNA, which strings together amino acids. Remember also that within mRNA, there are sections that are important and sections that are not important, introns and exons. The part of the mRNA that's an intron and the part that's an exon is dependent on what kind of cell it is and what kind of proteins that cell will need to make. Remember that the exons will exit the nucleus and do things out in the cytoplasm. The introns get left behind in the nucleus. So how do cells decide which parts of the mRNA should be an intron and which parts should be an exon? Here I've drawn three cells that each had the same DNA in them. Now, I know that normally the cell's DNA would be coiled up inside a chromosome, which would be housed inside a nucleus, but we're going to try to keep this drawing simple. These three cells are going to become skin, muscle, and blood cells. Now, notice how each of these different cells has a very different shape. That's because they all are going to do different jobs. In addition to looking different, they're also going to use different sections of the DNA. The skin cell might only use this green portion of the DNA to transcribe into RNA. Then within that portion of transcribed RNA, you're going to have introns and exons. The muscle cell might only use the red portion. The cells determine which parts of the DNA they need to use to code for RNA by using something called transcription factors. A transcription factor is a protein that binds to the DNA and therefore starts the transcription process in that spot. Because it controls the places where the DNA is coded into RNA, it controls which proteins the cell is going to make. Remember, a skin cell is going to make different proteins than a blood cell because they have different tasks. Transcription factors activate genes, or specific sections of DNA, by deciding whether or not to use them. If we use a section of DNA, we refer to the gene as being activated. If it is not being used, it is inactivated. Certain genes can only be activated in certain kinds of cells. You'd never activate a section of DNA that's used for heart cells if you were trying to make proteins in a nerve cell. However, there are some kinds of cells that can do everything. When a sperm and egg unite, they form a cell called a zygote. A zygote is one cell. However, it has the ability to ultimately divide and form every kind of cell that the resulting organism will need. First, it divides and forms two cells, then four, then eight, then 16, and so on. In the first few stages of development and during the first few divisions, these cells are extremely powerful because any one of them could become whatever kinds of tissues or cells the organism might need. These cells are called totipotent cells. They can become whatever kinds of tissues you need based on what's around them. The process is complicated, but essentially the cells take a look at what's around them, and then the appropriate transcription factors decode the DNA in the correct regions to make the cell match the tissues around it. After a few rounds of division, however, these cells lose their ability to be flexible. They lose their totipotency and become specialized cells. So they become only neurons, only stomach cells, only skin cells, etc. We call this specialization process differentiation. Remember, the cells in the first few stages are able to transform into any kind of cell, but you could never take a liver cell and change it into a neuron. You may have heard of totipotent cells under another name. Totipotent cells can also be called stem cells. 
Stem cells have been in the news a lot in the last few years, both because of their potential for serious medical breakthroughs and also because of the ethics of stem cells. Stem cells can be used in many ways, including the ability to grow new tissues. If you put stem cells over a burned area on a patient, the cells will then grow new skin over the affected area. If you put them into the spinal cord of someone who's been paralyzed, they have the potential to help regrow the damaged neurons and allow the person to regain feeling and some control over the bottom half of their body. It's also worthwhile to think about the ethics of stem cells. Because totipotent cells have to come from the union of an egg and a sperm, that union of an egg and a sperm, or that zygote, could ultimately grow into a person someday. If the zygote could ultimately become a person, is it already a person? And if it's already a person, should those cells have rights? At what point does it become alive, and at what point does it acquire the rights of a human being? That pretty much wraps it up. Thanks for watching.